This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show. As we make our way to the uh, top of the hour, we'll take uh, this hour and replay it for you and then get ready for our uh, double header tonight coming to you live on uh, 92.7 FM up there in Madison, Wisconsin. And, of course, uh, Revol- RevolutionRadioNetwork.com right here on the uh, on the website. Uh, we will be broadcasting live tonight, 7 to 10 Central Time, uh, 8 to 11 Eastern. And um, my numbers are right. I think that's 5 to 8 uh, Pacific Time where we find our next guest. He, of course, is Mr. Seattle. He's the Renaissance man. Democracy Watch News right here every Tuesday on the Jeff Santo Show. Mr. MTC himself, Mark Taylor Canfield, joins us. And we're hearing that heart is uh, once again in the music news, at least Ann Wilson is. Uh, how you doing, Mark? I'm doing good. We got uh, Trump or Biden, Trump or Biden. That's the whole country's deciding. Trump or Biden, Trump or Biden. Who do you want to win? That was the song we were singing today. But yeah, Ann Wilson has a new song out, and it, I'm really excited about it. There's a lot of cool stuff going on, and um, I'm I'm really happy. Je- Jeff, it's an exciting day because I actually got r- almost moved to tears by Ann Wilson's song. It's called The Revolution Starts Now, and it's amazing. It's uh, It really does speak to the mood of the country in a lot of places. And as I said before, you know, on our last show, Crosscut did a poll here and found that the majority of people do support the Black Lives Matter movement. So she's speaking right to the Seattle audience as well with this new song. And so I think it's great. It does have a, a kind of a, like the old heart feel, which we all came, you know, to know and love and has really influenced my music. And then also... I'm excited about this. I'm um, going to be participating in a roundtable discussion with the PBS Frontline filmmakers that have a brand new documentary that's also premiering today. So today's a big day for a lot of breaking things. This is breaking, folks. Just premiered today at PBS.org is their new the Frontline PBS documentary called Whose Vote Counts. And it's really, really important. I think it's kind of essential watching for people at this point. And uh, the filmmakers are, uh, uh, they're amazing people. You know, two of them are actually professors of journalism at Columbia University. So, I mean, these are really like hard-hitting people. They know exactly what they're talking about. And it's a subject that you've talked to Greg Post about and I've talked to Greg Post about. And it's something that really worries me right now, Jeff. Well, of course. Now, you know, well, we were I'm just talking excited. about it earlier. Well, I mean, this is... This is uh this is going to be the next two weeks. You know, I mean, you can talk all you want about electoral college. You can talk all you want about getting out to vote. But, I mean, if they're going to be secretaries of state, particularly in the South and particularly where their um, Republicans control the voting apparatus in Florida and Ohio, they do everything. Secretary of state, AG, legislative body, um, governor's office. And that, that to me, is, is really scary because, we, you know, Trump has done it before. We saw it with Bush in Florida and Ohio. So um, these next two weeks, I, again, have been saying this for a long time, Biden should get every person he can to vote for him who is a progressive, because that's a pool of voters that are still very reluctant. They're going to vote probably, but get some enthusiasm. Get out there with AOC. I mean, I can't imagine that if uh, if Joe Biden was to take a, a trip out west, maybe stop in Montana and help Bullock in, in that Senate race there, and then go to Seattle with AOC and get out, you know, all that youth vote, what that does is it, it opens the door for a AOC Joe Biden alliance that could take place the day after the election that opens the possibilities of a, of a of a renaissance speaking to the renaissance man of you know progressive politics in Washington D.C. and uh, to me this is a win win and and then take AOC throughout the West and in places like Arizona and Texas where you could could win a, a couple of states I. I, I can't you imagine people in Seattle not uh, not being excited about that kind of uh, appearance by Biden and, and AOC. I think that yeah, he should have Pramila Jayapal up there on the on the dais with him. I mean, come on, she is a powerhouse. You know, I only wish that she could run for president at some point, but I think we'd have to change the constitution to make that happen. But yeah, yeah, yeah was, born in born in a foreign country. Born, yeah, yeah, it wasn't naturalized here. Not born with naturalized parents, but all of, you know, there is a way. 
of making this uh, progressive movement. Of, by the way, I think Anne's song should be your theme song. I mean, the revolution starts now. For the well, no, Radio I mean, Network. I was going to say, they made perfect fit. for the Revolution Radio Network, right? Jeez. Yes, perfect fit. And she's so timely. I cannot believe it. She's really inspiring me to get my song about the protests in Seattle. You know, tear gas in Seattle. It's just another day. I want to get that song out there because, like I said, I ran into her down on the lake with her boat. And I thought, man, what is she up to these days? And I didn't even think to ask her, what are you releasing next? Because, you know, I always assumed that she was in retirement and just kind of living off all these royalties, living the good life, you know, out on her boat. But no, she's just as vital as ever. Her voice sounds strong and, and clear and good. It's that same and iconic Ann Wilson sound. It reminds me of the old stuff. And it really did move me. And when I was listening to it, I was thinking, oh, my God, what, why aren't other musicians doing this? Why aren't other musicians singing the song of the times like Dylan did or Simon and Garfunkel and, you know, Jimi Hendrix? I mean, where are these people today that could be speaking to the whole nation? Um, music is a very, very powerful tool. And that's another thing that the Democrats should start thinking about is doing a Bernie Sanders style event where it's more like a, a concert, a rock concert, yeah. an event than a political speech, you know. Well, I, I think that, political speeches, especially this time of year, of course. Yeah, I think that the big thing, of course, is, is, the, is the pandemic, which, of course, is, you know, I know that you yeah. have talked about on the show that you can't do the same shows that you, you always have done before a live audience and you got to go on top of the roof or whatever. Although, I will say this, my favorite band, as you all know, is U2, and one of their famous videos from the 1980s was, uh, and of course, it, it caused uh, police in Los Angeles, a.k.a. Mr. Gates back then, um, <clears throat> the infamous Mr. Gates, they did a live video, which they made out of an actual event on top of a roof in uh, East Los Angeles. Streets have no name, which, of course, we use on the, the intro here on the program. And so maybe that's that's something that uh, Joe Biden has to do. You know, he gets a handful of people and, you know, people are down in the streets and, you know, he, he does his event. If that's the safest way to do it, then why not? You're right. I am completely jonesing, as they say, for live performance right now. You, you have no idea what it's like to be a musician who really does feed off the energy of crowds sure. and really thrives on live performance. I mean, I love being in the recording studio, too, because I grew up, you know, listening to Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, and Sgt. Pepper's Lillian Hearts Club, and, you know, just amazing album studio masterpieces. So I'm all about spending a lot of time in the studio and honing the the craft but also i really love to be on stage so it's difficult right now so i end up performing for a few friends here or there i play by myself sometimes just to keep that energy going i'm getting a new drummer just so this is like life changing to find a drummer that uh is not going to work with five other bands and jilt me at the last minute at the altar so to speak as we get ready to do our grammy award-winning performance you know uh, we've talked about this before about my problems with drummers but it's, <laughs> that's going to change by the way fedex did lose my custom electric one-of-a-kind electric guitar that someone was sending me that i'd already bought they did lose it. It just disappeared, Jeff. I don't know what happened, where their, the truck just disappeared and ended up in the toilet zone with Rod Serling or something. But FedEx did refund the money, which I appreciate. But I don't appreciate the fact that somewhere there's a guitar that I ordered and has a built-in amplifier and a built-in speaker, so you don't need that equipment when you go out on the boat or whatever. That is missing somewhere in the universe. So if anybody knows where that guitar is, please give me a call. I have a finder's fee for you. I'll give you a reward. And the other thing is, Jeff, I was thinking about this as a theme song for our segment is Tuesday afternoon. That Moody Blues song always goes through my head. I like that, Tuesdays. man. Yeah, Tuesdays. Yeah. Well, you know, we're it's doing two for Tuesdays song. now, classic rock uh, deal. And uh, so, you know, we're doing morning, uh, afternoon, and evening. And one of these days, uh, before we uh, close that calendar out, we're going to have to get on MTC to kind of wrap it up there. It'll be late night in uh, the East Coast and the West Coast, but uh, East Coast in the, in, the, in the Central Time Zone. But, you know, it'll be only uh, 7.30 or so in the West Coast. So, you know, why not? We're going we're to try to make that happen uh, hey, I for you, I can sing you, you guys sir. a song over the phone or something. You know, yeah. <laughs> you can come up with a political song. I'm trying to write these political songs all the time, but I'm also, you know, trying to finish a couple books and doing the 
the acting and the radio series and things. So I'm so busy that it's hard for me to get the the songs out there on a timely basis. Like, and credit to Ann Wilson once again for hitting the the iron while it's hot, so to speak. So right now, it's we're getting for ready for the election. People are in the mood to hear that kind of song. So she released it at the exact right time. It's a really nice production, so it sounds good. And I think it's going to be a hit. I think people are going to love it. You probably hear this song a lot now, Jeff. I think uh, Ann Wilson is back. Well, back, you know what we got to do, Mark. Uh, you back. know, off air, you're going to have to give me uh, the publicist and uh, the folks here. We'll have to get Ann Wilson on. You know, when you're on some Tuesday afternoon and, uh, you know, talk about the revolution. Ooh. And, uh, you know, so there there we go. we got, we got some homework to do over the next month post, uh, post November 3rd. Speaking of November 3rd, I, I would have to think that um, th- there is some word on the governor's race or is it just nobody cares? Is, does Inslee have an opponent that's going to come more than 20 points behind him? Or what, what is happening there? I have a big, long answer for you, Jeff. No. <laughs> He's the Republicans just give up? The Republican candidate is the former uh, police chief from Republic Washington, which is kind of funny considering he's a Republican, but not getting much uh, ground. Much traction, not making no. much well, that's ground. Good. No. That's good. Jay Hensley is firmly in control. He has shown throughout the pandemic that he's the kind of leader you want. In the governor's house, uh, we may not agree with him on every single issue. I think he's been slow to solve the issues with education, and that's something that I would be glad also to talk to uh, Melissa Tomlinson about at some point, talk about roundtable discussions or panel discussions, because Washington State really has a problem with funding education, yeah. Yeah. and I haven't seen our progressive governor solve that. There's also There are also other issues um, that he hasn't been quite as progressive enough on, from my point of view, but just in terms of you know meeting the guy and being around him, he's... I guess in the old days, like in the 1940s, when my radio series is set in that area, they would have called him a swell guy. He's a swell guy. In other words, he doesn't piss people off. He's not adversarial. Um, he's very lighthearted and can be uh, has a great sense of humor. He's very self-depreciating, likes to laugh at himself, things like that. But uh, when it's time to get serious, he gets serious, and I appreciate that. And he doesn't seem to have as much of a a really um, obvious, at least, neoliberal agenda in the way that maybe our mayor, Jenny Durkin, has. He he doesn't always side with corporations. Now, he did call a special session of the state legislature just to deal with the tax issue with Boeing, you know, which is what major corporations are able to do around here. They can't call a special session to solve the uh, disaster in our education system. And the fact that the state Supreme Court was actually fining our state legislature every day for contempt <laughs> for not solving the problem uh, because our Constitution requires, you know, adequate education in A through 12. But he was willing to call a special session for uh, at the behest of Boeing. So, you know, that kind of tells you we're still fighting these major, major multinational corporations in the area who do tend to try to control um, politics. And they right, oh, no doubt. I mean, this is this is the way of the world. It, it happened with Obama. It's obviously happening with DeVos, with Trump as Secretary of Education, both. Um, let me ask you, in terms of funding, does Washington, you know, at the bottom of the country in terms of funding public schools? I don't know if you have those numbers. Well, no, we're not at the bottom, but the problem is, is that the state Supreme Court has ruled that the very process by which our funding is done, and that's why one of the things I'd like to talk to Melissa about is what other models are used, uh, for instance, in her part of the country and other districts. But in Washington State, there is a levy, a ballot measure that has to be passed it's not easy in some, especially small communities where people don't have much money to ask them to raise their property taxes again in order to fund education. And of course, people who don't have kids are sometimes kind of loath to go for that. But that's the only way that we have found at this point to do most of the funding for education in Washington state. There is no state income tax. That's a big issue. Uh, as far as I know, the governor has not taken that on. But eventually, Jeff, and I've been saying this for years, eventually a Democrat in the governor's office and the state legislature are going to have to deal with that issue. And, you know, even billionaires like Bill Gates says, well, of course there should be some kind of income tax. I mean, he's willing to pay it. It's just that it's never been an issue that the Republicans in the state <laughs> would move on. Uh, this is like a tax haven, right? Well, but so what, what role, say, I mean, I, I presume they could they could block some things in the legislature, but the Democrats control both bodies, right? House and Senate there? 
maybe things will change. But the one thing that did change in 2016 is that more Democrats were able to get into the state legislature, and immediately they started passing all sorts of uh, election reform and transparency laws, which the Republicans were constantly blocking. So, I mean, it should show, it should just be very telling right there, folks, that whenever you deal with the Republican Party, it's, it's always about, at least in this part of the country, which I can speak about, it's always about, no, we don't really want more transparency. No, we don't really want more voting, voting. We don't really want more democracy. We really just want to keep it into the hands of the people who have already got the power. And that is not, what this country was founded on. I think right. e- lately I've been well, saying that even folks like Teddy Roosevelt would be tearing his hair out right now and looking at monopoly capitalism and how it's just destroying small businesses across the country. He would hate that. He was a bu- trust buster. Let me ask you, like uh, it, 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 it's, it would, would Swant be able, and others that are there, um, you know, some of your friends in the city council there in Seattle, would they be willing uh, to be part of a, of a general strike? We've heard this now. Uh, in fact, it's been even mentioned uh, in passing by uh, Mr. Trump, the head of the AFL-CIO. If somehow Trump was going to uh, end up contesting the election and, you know, would would uh, basically you know turn the country into a dictatorship. Um, would, would the people of Seattle, again, led by the Swans of the world, be into a general strike shutting down? You know, Amazon and Boeing and, and those big corporations there for however many days until, you know, it would obviously have an impact or even potentially doing it, even if Biden would win, you know, to push for a Medicare for all, to push for more police reform. Well, it's interesting that you ask that question, Jeff, because Seattle was the first major city in the United States to conduct a general strike in 1919. I heard that. And I can tell you this, the city is very proud of that heritage, and people were very cooperative during the strike and kind of policed themselves and tried to, you know, help each other out with food and other supplies the same way that I've seen during the Black Lives Matter movement at the CHOP Zone where, you know, just, you know, everybody's offering free services, free food, free everything. Um, That kind of thing went on in the city for a while. Um, Also, just a, a note is that in previous uh, times and during the Iraq War, uh, the longshoremen and teamsters were able to close down the West Coast ports. It's been done before. Um, so, very salient question, something that's probably on some folks' minds. Um, but Seattle is has a tradition of uh, holding general a general strike. So, it would I'm sure you would probably find more support than just from Shama Sawan on that issue here. It's I mean it's part of our. It's part of our heritage to to hold general strikes. Yeah. Well, no, it is. I think it happened two years after your Seattle Metropolitan's hockey team won the Stanley Cup, if I'm not mistaken, as well, in 1970. Oh, by the way, we have a rugby team. I keep trying to tell people Yes, that. yes, you, 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 were, you were telling me that in the text earlier today. <laughs> the Seawolves, go Seawolves. Yes. Their season uh, how many people do they draw, though? I mean, you know, before the pandemic. What, you know, 55, hey, they 60? they sold, Jeff, we're talking, they sold at least 2,000 uh season tickets so come on that's mm-hmm. well okay so it's not the nba but <laughs> they're just started, not, they've only been around be, uh, for you know look uh, you know for, my late uncle used year. to play it in england and, and later in new zealand so i i, I know i know it's, it's cool thing. i watched the world cup between england and South Africa in London, and it was the most incredible thing. Unfortunately, <laughs> the English lost, so everybody was depressed and sad and drank too much afterwards. Exactly. There. But, yeah. Back to the pub. But it was Mintumba was his name. He was this incredible. I think he was a player from Fiji, and there are some players from Fiji um, on the Seattle team. There are players from Canada, from the UK, Ireland, Great Britain, um, and. It's so South Africa too. There are some um, players from South Africa on the Seattle team. So, but the thing I'm impressed about them, the reason I keep talking about them, is that one, they get left out by any national me- media and sports writers. Just ignore rugby in this country. It's like having a cricket team. I mean, just nobody cares, right? But they, but they are very community oriented and they're very dedicated to creating a, a rugby structure in in this um, city the way that they've done with soccer. Mm which is introducing it into the schools, having after-school programs, having camps for the kids, having the players out in the community all the time. Now, that was going on well, in you know, March. Uh, and, by the way, they won the major rugby league championship last year. So Seattle is the champions. We're the champions in the, in the major league soccer 
uh, Union, as they call it, in, in Europe, and we're also the champions. So we're Seattle just, just kicks ass when it comes to sports that, you know. Well, there you go, that nobody coming. knows about, right? <laughs> that nobody <laughs> attends. But no, but you, you, have a, you have an unbeaten football team, and Russell yeah. Wilson uh, comes to mind because tonight, I uh, again, uh, all of our audience folks, we're going to be talking uh, to uh, Justin Blake, who's the uncle of Jacob Blake of of uh, uh, the horrific situation in Kenosha of a couple of months ago, and check up on on his nephew. And this, to me, uh, connects the dots to another great Wisconsin leader, and that's of course uh, the football player and now the Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson, who went to the University of Wisconsin. This is this issue that you have covered so much and done some tremendous work of of, of police uh, violence and police brutality. Uh, Russell Wilson and, and, and African American players as a whole, from NBA and NFL, have done a really great job of of making this an issue now. And I think that's a, a critical critical um, development that has you know I think put a lot of police unions on their heels. And uh, you know, you know, obviously they're going to fight back. But the the fact is, is that I think that that part of it, African American and white um, football players and and basketball players, and can be both, you know, an intimidating presence as well as uh, one that would open and inspire a lot of people. Your thoughts about Wilson before we roll? Well, uh, I, you know, the Seahawks are, are more than willing to take a knee with the rest of the country on that issue. Pete Carroll and the players have, have been very supportive of Black Lives Matter. So I think the sports franchises have done an amazing job. The players, not necessarily the owners, of course, uh, but the players have done a really good job of highlighting this issue in a way that other folks in society just haven't had the courage to do. And so I really give them a lot of credits for that. I think sports, you know, Russell Wilson is, is a role model. So what he says, kids listen to, people listen to. He is so popular in Seattle. He's got to be the most popular person in Seattle at the moment. I mean, everybody loves Russell Wilson. Maybe he should I run for mayor. Holster, I guess, by talking about, because somebody asked me online whether he was whether he smoked pot, and I just said, well, he's from Seattle. Who knows? I mean, I know the NFL has, rest- has restrictions on that kind of thing, but there have been NFL players who have gone public saying, we really want to be able to use um, cannabis on our off the field, you know, on our own time. And it's just that he was saying that he was in, during a, his show, which is called Danger Talk, because his nickname uh, and his uh, Twitter handle is Danger Russ. He was he was just saying that he was really high. They were asking him how he's feeling. Oh, I'm really high. I'm really high because I mean they have a five and zero record. Number one, number two, they had a bye week, so he was off and has all this energy right because he's used to working out every day and training, and they're telling him to stay home. Yeah. And then three, he's just there's a lot of love on that team right now. They have a lot of. Potential. Well, he's, he's not out the leader. And you got a great coach in Pete Carroll, who uh, I've interviewed over the past. They got to do better think, on defense, though. Yeah, they, they yeah. got to get some more defensive <laughs> players before the trade deadline. Right. Uh, hey, right. Mark, uh, keep on uh, keep on doing what you're doing, man. The Renaissance man on the radio, and um, we will get the Ann Wilson uh, on the air with us and and uh, try to make it happen. Uh, Always that's, a pleasure, that's, Jeff. That's a big thing. Hey, you too, you man. Guys rock. Check out my YouTube channel if you want to see the MTC report and some of my new music. And then check out Democracy Watch News and the Seattle Star, which is really rocking here in Seattle. Those guys are doing great stuff. And they don't get much credit either, so they, they need to. But we'll see you next time. See you next Tuesday, my friend. All okay. the best. Mark Taylor Thanks, Canfield Jeff. right here on the Jeff Santos Show. I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. Thank you for listening, folks. Remember, we're back on live in a few hours, 7 to 10 Central Time, 8 to 11 Eastern, 5 to 8 Pacific. Uh, we will be uh, rocking in the free world uh, on 92.7 FM in Madison, Wisconsin, as well as on Revolution Radio Network. Again, talking to uh, Justin uh, Blake, the uncle of Jacob Blake of Kenosha, Wisconsin and uh, we'll get the status on his condition and so forth. Until then, my name is Jeff Santos. I gotta go! This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together.